Um, direct, director of liturgy. Yeah, that's right. So, sometimes vice principal. Yeah. Eastern Region Ministry Course. Mm. Um, I'm going to speak to us from an anthem perspective, of course. I love how many Methodists references can you get in one title? Yes. Well, Thank you. Um, the, uh, 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 well, first of all, um, when, when I uh, uh, was teaching at uh, St John's College in Durham, and I used to often uh, take um, appointments on the uh, Durham and Dennis Valley circuit, uh, one Sunday uh, I was preaching at uh, Elbert Methodist Church, as some of you will know, and uh, in the vestry beforehand uh, with the steward, uh, before the steward said the uh, prayer, uh, she leaned over to me and said, are you one of us or one of them? <laughs> and I said, well, I am an Anglican priest, but I, I do teach a lot of Methodist students. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the unofficial subtitle of this talk ought to be, um, a, a, an Anglican tries it on with some Methodists. Uh, in, in two senses, one is that I want to uh, test out uh, um, some ideas around aspects of Anglican theology to do with episcopacy, um, uh, to see how uh, a Methodist audience, uh, particularly a theologically literate one, might respond. Uh, but also, uh, it is a bit of a, a cheek to come to a, a, an Anglican to come to Methodist gathering and to uh, talk about Methodist theology. Though I think I do understand quite a bit about Methodist theology, uh, having worked in Anglican Methodist contexts for the best part of, uh, of, of 20 years. Though I have to say, sadly, in my current context, uh, we, have, uh, we have lost our Methodist students temporarily, but we'll no doubt find out where we put them. Um, uh, so, and I also must apologise that as I was looking at my PowerPoint slides last night, um, uh, I realised that there are quite a lot of Anglican bishops on these slides, which I do apologise, but actually that might be a Freudian message. Uh, to do what we have to deal with. Now, I'm going to focus on uh, the, um, the, the current round of talks between the Church of England and the Methodist Church uh, in Great Britain, uh, stemming from this document, the Anglican Methodist Covenant document, and I think Martin might take us back to a, 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 a other rounds of stuff later. Um, but, um, uh, but I just want, I'm going to start uh, with, with where we were uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, um, Oops, oh, there we go. This does work. Um, uh, where uh, one of the, uh, that seems to me looking back, the, 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 the key reason why previous attempts at Anglican Methodist uh, Union talks failed was around the issue of episcopacy. And uh, as you, I'm sure, will know, uh, one of the uh, proposals in, in earlier rounds of talks uh, was that there should be kind of mutual laying on of hands and kind of and uh, trying to avoid the, 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 the language of reordaining uh, uh, Methodist uh, presbyters. Uh, but it all felt rather as though it wasn't the mutual laying on of hands at all, although that's what the document said. It felt, from what I can see of the documents at the time, uh, that it was more a one-way street laying on of hands, much more in this kind of model. And um, now, uh, I, although I lived through this, I was too young to remember it, uh, but in one of the uh, documents I've acquired since in second-hand bookshops, um, uh, um, a little booklet um, uh, written by four Anglicans and four Methodists opposing uh, the earlier scheme, and one of the reasons they oppose it uh, is that uh, the Anglicans writing in here, people like Jim Packer, um, uh, oppose it because they say um, whatever uh, is meant to be happening in the laying on of hands on, on, of Anglicans laying hands on Methodist presbyters, it sure looks to us Anglicans like reordination, and we don't approve of that because we think the Methodist presbyters are ordained enough already. Uh, and uh, within Anglicanism, within the Church of England, there's quite a breadth of opinion even today as to how you handle issues of episcopacy, uh, ordination, and interchangeability of ministry, and that's one thing I'm going to come to. So um, let's cut to the chase uh, with this. Uh, this document uh, lays out uh, several things. On the whole, this document says there's lots of things uh, that the Church of England and British Methodists agree on. And I think it's slightly optimistic in some ways in what it thinks we agree on. Uh, but it does at least start with the kind of note of hope. And I think that in terms of the shape of ecumenical dialogue, that I think is where we do uh, begin. Uh, when I was a curate in the Diocese of, of, of Manchester, 
Uh, at one point, as part of our curate training, uh, we, had a, we had a study day with the Roman Catholic curates in the Diocese of Salford. And Patrick Kelly, who was the Bishop of Salford then, the Catholic Bishop of Salford, uh, he, I don't remember anything else much in this day. One thing I do remember Patrick Kelly saying, we've had years of ecumenical dialogue between all sorts of churches where we have talked about the things that we agree on and the things we share. And that's right that we should do that. But sooner or later, you've got to talk about the things that you don't agree on. Now, I think that's the right way around. I think you start by talking about what you agree on and you build on that. But you've got to address the things where you don't agree sooner or later. And, we've, and in this um, uh, um, current round uh, between uh, the Church of England and British Methodism, uh, we have started with a lot of things we agree on, but we're now beginning to talk about the things that we might not agree on or we might not quite agree on. And so in the General Synod uh, of the Church of England in February, I'm a member of the General Synod, uh, we had a debate uh, on the, uh, the next phase of this um, uh, and uh, looking at some concrete proposals for moving towards interchangeability of, uh, of ordained ministry. Um, and that will take us into issues of episcopacy. So I'm going to focus um, on, on, on that. Um, I have to say that um, uh, um, um, I stood to speak all through the debate and was not called. Got a bit cross that some of the people who were called uh, didn't appear to know what they were talking about. Uh, so this is not my synod speech, tarted up into an academic paper, uh, but um, uh, I've but I was slightly frustrated that uh, some of the things that were said in the General Synod debate uh, seemed to be rather ill-informed about Methodist theology and practice, and I will, in fact, return to some of that in a minute or two. Uh, so, um, uh, what are the issues that Anglicans and Methodists in, uh, in, in England certainly need to talk about uh, to, to, to see where we uh, don't agree and how we might move uh, for perhaps to, to a more measure of agreement. Well, certainly episcopacy is still, I think, the key uh, issue. Um, uh, so I, I, I chose the former Bishop of London because he just does grumpy very well. Um, um, and you'll see the new Bishop of London in a minute who's um, a rather different person. Um, there's much more uh, to the areas of theology we need to address than simply episcopacy. But episcopacy is a key area, I think. And I'm going to suggest that within Anglican theology, there is a broader theological approach to issues of episcopacy than people often think. And I partly want to try it out on you to see whether this broader approach from an Anglican perspective has any traction in terms of us moving forward. Um, uh, well, you might say that just shows how difficult Anglicans are to talk to because you can't agree among yourselves. Well, before we get to episcopacy, uh, one of the issues that this report... Uh, d addresses as, uh, or mentions as, a, as an issue uh, which we, uh, the two churches need to look at uh, is the issue of um, Calvinism as opposed to Arminianism. Now the interesting thing is that in the previous rounds of talks back in the 60s, 70s and 80s as far as I can see um, uh, the Calvinist-Arminian divide wasn't really addressed or seen as an issue um, though I'm willing to be corrected, particularly in the next paper, uh, by those who have looked at this more. Uh, but, uh, but, in, but in the current round, um, the Calvinist-Arminian issue is flagged up as something that divides Anglicans, who are meant to be Calvinists apparently, from uh, Methodists who we all know to be Arminians. Um, now, uh, why, why, has this come, why has this come back? Um, well, uh, it's come back, um, one, one way it's come back is that it is, it is often alleged that historically Anglicanism is Calvinist, and so you look in the 39 articles, and you will find this is a long quote from, um, uh, from Article 10. I've got an even longer quote I didn't put on the screen. Uh, and this is perhaps not as Calvinist as it could be, but it's, uh, it's kind of Calvinist enough. Um, uh, the condition of man after the fall of Adam is such that he cannot turn and prepare himself by his own natural strength and good works to faith and calling upon God. Wherefore, we have no power to do good works, pleasant and acceptable to God, without the grace of God by Christ preventing us, i.e. going before us, of course, uh, that we may have a good will and working with us uh, when we have that good will. Uh, that is not as Calvinist as it could be, um, but, it's, but, it's, but it's, a, it's at least a bit Calvinist, if you see what I mean. And I think one of the, uh, one of the issues about the way in which Anglicans sometimes have um, uh, interpreted their past is that there is a strand of contemporary Anglicanism that looks back to Anglican origins 
as being uh, very Calvinist indeed. Now, as somebody who teaches mainly in the area of liturgy, I think I want to say that when you look at Thomas Cranmer's liturgies, they are not Calvinist. Uh, they, they owe a bit to, to John Calvin, certainly, uh, but they are not kind of Calvinist. So I would play on the distinction that we've heard of already uh, between Calvin and Calvinism, which I think are separable things. And I think that, that the Anglican historic formularies, like the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 Articles, go for um, a sort of Calvinism, a, a, a sort of a legacy of John Calvin, but not quite the kind of second-generation Calvinism. And I think that even that is hedged about with lots of other stuff. So why is it that in this document it says that Arminianism versus Calvinism is one of the issues that we need to address? Well, here is my uh, slightly scholarly and a bit political take on the answer to why the issue has come back. And I'm going to blame one person who happens to be a friend of mine, but I'm going to blame him. Um, within the Anglican Church, in, well, within the Church of England, there's been a bit of a Calvinist resurgence in the last 20 or 30 years. And one of the people who has been a leading player in the resurgence of Calvinism within the evangelical wing of the Church of England uh, is Angus Maclay, who is my friend. Um, uh, who, we were curates together in this diocese. Uh, Angus Maclay, who's the vicar of St. Nicholas uh, Seven Oaks, And he was one of the Anglican members of the group that produced this. And so when I read it, and it went on about Calvinism and Arminianism, and how Anglicans are Calvinists and Methodists are Arminians, and that means that we find it very hard to agree with each other, I thought, um, actually, most Anglicans wouldn't, know, wouldn't have seen it that way. And um, that's, that seems to me that is Angus uh, speaking on behalf of um, a particular group uh, within the evangelical wing, and certainly not, not even all evangelical Anglicans. And so within uh, the Church of England, we have three conservative evangelical pressure groups. They're all about to merge into one, by the way, uh, which, have, which have kind of spearheaded this Calvinist resurgence. Uh, reform, the Fellowship of Word and Spirit, and Church Society. They're all going to merge under the Church Society uh, umbrella. Now, um, if I just speak anecdotally for a moment, um, uh, I grew up within the evangelical wing of the Church of England, and uh, what I now know uh, is that it was an, an Arminian form of evangelicalism. Uh, I didn't know the word Arminian until I got to university uh, here in Manchester. Uh, and even then I didn't quite know that I was an Arminian. Uh, and I didn't, certainly didn't know that I was supposed to be a Calvinist. Um, um, uh, um, I, I met Calvinists uh, through the University of Christian Union, but they were, no, none of them were Anglicans. They were all members of, um, of independent evangelical churches. And it's only in recent years that I've met Anglicans uh, who claim the Calvinist or Reformed label. And I think the fact is that within the evangelical wing of the Church of England, most evangelicals are in fact, whether they know it or not, Arminians. A bit like in um, uh, uh, Molière's uh, Bourgeois Gentilhomme, uh, Monsieur Jourdain uh, finds out to his surprise he's been speaking prose all his life without knowing it. Uh, and I think that most, uh, uh, most Anglicans, whether evangelical or not, are Arminian by default. Uh, but there's been this Calvinist resurgence. Uh, it's not a majority option, uh, but I think that's why the Calvinist-Arminian thing has come back uh, into, into play. Uh, the next issue that the report highlights, which, we have, which apparently we have to talk about and uh, decide what we think, um, is um, uh, what uh, Anglicans often want to call perfectionism, uh, but I have learnt to call something like uh, uh, scriptural holiness. Um, uh, or, um, or, or some, some other term. Uh, and this did come up in the debate in the February, in February General Synod where one person made a speech that said, uh, well, Methodists all believe uh, in perfectionism and that, uh, and that, and that, you, and that you can be um, sinless uh, in this life. And, and I thought, well, mm, that's... Um, uh, I know in a synod speech where you've got three minutes, you've got to kind of cut corners. That really is cutting quite a lot of corners. Uh, and most Methodists that I know uh, either say mm, we, we wouldn't want to talk in those terms or we'd want to nuance it quite a lot. So I put this up as an issue we're supposed to talk about, but actually I think that this is not quite the issue that the Covenant document makes of it. Uh, and that's because, I'm afraid, I think Anglicans are largely ignorant of the way in which this aspect of Wesley's theology actually plays out. And actually, of course, even within Wesley's theology, uh, it's quite, uh, quite nuanced.
Uh, so I'm just going to park that, we might come back to it, uh, because actually I think there's something in this which is about a gift that Methodism brings to uh, the Church of England, is helping uh, other churches to think through these issues. Here's another issue we're supposed to sort out before we can agree with each other, which is lay presidency. And I'm sorry, I couldn't find a picture on the internet uh, of, uh, of, a, of a, um, a Methodist uh, layperson uh, uh, presiding at communion, so this has had to be uh, a Methodist presbyter. Um, uh, but um, I think the first thing is that, again, from the Church of England side, on the whole, people in the Church of England, have got, they, they vaguely know that uh, people other than presbyters sometimes preside at the Eucharist in Methodist churches, but they don't know what that's about or why it is. So they don't know about the theological connection between uh, ministry and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and ordination and communion. The, the, the idea that the, the important, as I often say to my students, uh, in, in Methodist theology, the important thing is that people can receive the sacrament. And that's more important than doctrines of ordination. Uh, and so uh, the dispensation uh, for uh, lay presidency is in order to make the sacrament available to people. What you get in the Church of England are, again, some of the neo-Calvinists um, who uh, see this aspect of Methodist practice and they say, oh, whoopee, this is an, an, a bit of entryism, because within the neo-Calvinist uh, group, uh, they are quite keen on lay presidency per se, and, they, and they, they would sever the link, many of them, between ordination as a presbyter and presiding at the Eucharist, and so they would see uh, Methodist practice of lay presidency as supporting their cause. I think that's a misunderstanding of, uh, of, of, of the theological structure around lay presidency. Uh, but again, we might want to come back to that. Uh, another issue, uh, we are slowly getting towards bishops in a minute, uh, an, another issue uh, that the report flags up uh, is about different understandings of confirmation. Now, this is kind of don't get me started kind of stuff, because um, um, the Church of England doesn't know what it thinks about confirmation. Uh, you'll not be surprised to know that. Um, um, uh, until quite recently, when I was teaching kind of Liturgy 101, I could say to people, um, uh, the ecumenical consensus, including in the Church of England, is that baptism is what admits you to receiving Holy Communion, and confirmation is an historical uh, later development and afterthought. Um, and the Church of England's always kind of, in its official documents, gone um and hard about that, but has basically said that. But then in more recent years, we've had one or two people in the Church of England who have tried to bring confirmation back as an important part of Christian initiation, almost give back to being at the gateway to receiving Holy Communion. It put the clock back 50 years, really. Uh, I, I wrote a swinging review of, of, of a book uh, about this a few years ago, um, in which I did accuse the authors of wanting to set the clock back 50 years and being, you know, not having engaged with the ecumenical consensus. Uh, but even allowing for that with Anglicanism, my, my reading of the way in which things work in British Methodism is that confirmation looks to me in Methodism much more like um, kind of an adult ownership, entry into membership of the church kind of right, or adult membership of the church kind of right, uh, and, and less generally initiatory. But I'm willing for you to correct me if I've been telling people the wrong thing all these years. Uh, but, in, but we have moved towards ecumenical confirmations. So this is a, um, a bishop and a chair of district jointly confirming somebody uh, but, uh, but although, the, the, uh, although this report uh, lords this kind of development as a good thing, I think actually here it kind of begs a lot of theological questions, not least because Anglicans don't know what confirmation is and they don't know what they want it to be. So that might be an issue on which we actually do have to have a bit more discussion. Then uh, this report came out before the Church of England ordained any women as bishops, and so it says that one of the obstacles to Anglican Methodist uh, union or, or working to go any further is that um, uh, Methodists would, in my view, quite rightly, want to see all ordained ministry open to both men and women. So we have now uh, ordained uh, women as bishops, um, having made a mess of it several times. We've actually managed to do it. So we do have uh, some uh, women as bishops. There's the Bishop of Gloucester on the left, and the uh, uh, new Bishop of London, uh, Sarah Mullally, uh, on the right. 
so we've done that. Uh, so that's okay then. Uh, so our Methodist friends should uh, rejoice that we have finally uh, got there and have opened up all levels of ordained ministry uh, to women as well as to men, as it is in the Methodist Church. But I have to say, I should come clean and say, I've been a lifelong campaigner for the ordination of women in the Church of England, uh, and it seems to me that um, uh, ordaining women is not... It's not the, end of the, not the end of the theological or practical process. There's a whole lot of other issues that go along with it. Um, um, I'm, I, am, I'm, I am going to tell you this story because I know I haven't been a priest in this diocese uh, for nearly 20 years, so I can say this now. Uh, but we, we had a Diocese of Manchester clergy conference when I was here. And uh, some of us had had a, an ongoing row by email and letter with our bishop. Um, uh, because on the conference there were going to be two Eucharists every day, one presided over by one of the four bishops in the Diocese of Manchester, and also on, later on in the day, one presided over by what we were then calling a flying bishop, another bishop who catered for those who didn't agree with the ordination of women, and several of us said we can't, you know, we, we think this is divisive, we can't go along with this. Uh, we had a long row about this, and on the opening day of the conference, uh, the Darson Bishop, um, in the opening notices, uh, was put, well, he basically did a big put down of those of us who had objected to the two Eucharist thing. So afterwards, when the, we were going off to have afternoon tea, uh, one of the women clergy and I uh, went to have a word with the bishop to explain why we were cross. And uh, we tried to explain to the Bishop of Manchester why we were still cross with this uh, two Eucharist thing. And the bishop said, he looked completely uh, uh, nonplussed and couldn't see what we were saying. And, and, and the bishop said to the two of us, quote, Goodness me, I already ordain women, what more do the girls want? End of quote. I won't tell you what my colleague Barbara said, because it involves a very rude word. <laughs> Um, but she did point out that there weren't any girls in, 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 in the ranks of the ordained clergy of the Diocese of Manchester, but there were quite a lot of women, and they were cross with him. But I think there's a lot of that within the Church of England, of, of people who think we ordain women as bishops, that's the end of the story, that's okay then. But and I think one of the things we have to learn from, from Methodism is it's not the end of the story, uh, that there's a, there's a big agenda um, justice issue. So here's uh, washing some Anglican dirty linen in public. Uh, when we uh, consecrated women as bishops, we made it possible uh, for there to be um, provision for those who didn't agree with women bishops. And so around the ordination as bishop of Philip North, who's the guy in the middle uh, of that photo, uh, there were some issues. Uh, so Philip North, uh, who doesn't agree with the ordination of women, uh, was, well, first of all, he was asked to go and be bishop of Whitby. And the good people of Whitby in the Diocese of York said, we don't want another bishop that doesn't ordain women, and he pulled out of that job. And then he went to be Bishop of Burnley, which is where he is now. Um, when he was consecrated bishop, uh, the Archbishop of York set up a, separate, a special system of consecrating him bishop that meant that only bishops who didn't agree with the ordination of women laid hands on Philip, whereas the normal Church of England custom is that all the bishops gather around and, you know, that great rugby scrum and lay hands on. And the other bishops were sent a letter by the Archbishop of York saying... At Philip North's consecration, please show gracious restraint and don't lay hands on him, unless I've written to you to say you are one that can lay on hands. Now, it seems to me that's hugely theologically problematic in terms of practice. It's a practice that raises big theological issues. Uh, then Philip was uh, later on asked if he would go to be the Bishop of Sheffield in succession to Stephen Croft. And the good people of Sheffield, who'd had who, who, a third of the clergy in the Diocese of Sheffield are female, the good people of Sheffield said, uh, this is a problem, and asked Philip North to explain how he was going to be bishop to the third of the clergy who he didn't think were or should be ordained. And he couldn't give a decent answer to that, and so a great row erupted and he withdrew. Uh, and, then we had a, uh, and then we did a, 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 a kind of review of all this, headed by Philip Moore, uh, who's a former Church of England civil servant. And the Philip Moore report uh, goes on at great length about how Philip North felt about being rejected by the Diocese of Sheffield, but it gives no voice at all to the women clergy of the Diocese of Sheffield and no voice at all to lay people or ecumenical partners. So I tell you this because I think we've, the church has got a long way to go. We have not actually dealt with the issue of equal ordination in that sense. And then on the other end of the theological scale, we've appointed uh, as um, a, a conservative evangelical bishop, Rob Thomas, as Bishop of Maidstone, um, uh, who uh, on Philip North is Anglo-Catholic, Rob Thomas is uh, conservative and joyful, 
uh, who um, uh, disagrees with the ordination of women um, and women leadership on, on grounds of what he would term biblical headship. But if you look at his website, he connects this with a subordinationist doctrine of the Trinity. So on his website, he says, uh, one of the reasons that I don't agree with um, uh, the ordination of women is that within the Trinity, the Son is eternally subordinate to the Father and therefore women are eternally subordinate to men. Uh, if you want to know how you make that jump, um, well, I think I can explain it, but it does seem to me it's... Um, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm a teacher of doctrine part-time, and actually that is subordinationism. It's, uh, it's arguably semi-Aryan, so that's, uh, that's me off his Christmas card list. Uh, so, um, so, we've got a lot of, so we've got a lot of problems with Episcopacy, and I should now move to the cut to the chase, so we've got a bit of time for some questions. So um, what could um, Anglicans do... Um, with the doctrine of episcopacy uh, to kind of help us um, uh, smooth the way. And I'm going to mention uh, three things very quickly. First of all, within Anglicanism, there is a debate as to whether episcopacy is of the essay or ben, bene essay of the church. In other words, is episcopacy essential to have a church? In other words, if that's true, the slogan, no bishop, no church, comes into play. Or is it that episcopacy is a good idea, but if you haven't got episcopacy, it doesn't mean you're a bad person and not a church. So, uh, so which is it? Is episcopacy of the very essence of uh, ontology of the church, or is it uh, a, a good and commendable uh, means of leadership in the church? And you might imagine that the Church of England uniformly goes for the essay approach, but actually there are Church of England bishops who would say, no, uh, although we are ourselves bishops, we believe that bishops are not essential but they are beneficial. And the person who is articulating that within the House of Bishops at the moment is the Bishop of Wilsdon, Pete Broadbent. But in a previous generation, the same argument was put forward by Colin Buchanan, uh, now retired, uh, but he was Bishop of Aston and then, uh, and, and then Bishop of Woolwich. So that's one issue. That's one way in which Anglicanism can flex the doctrine of episcopacy. Another way in which it can be flexed is by uh, detaching um, the notion of oversight uh, from being embodied within a person and seeing oversight more generally. And the person who has argued this most consistently in the Church of England, though, though he hasn't thought of it himself, he did nick it off other places, but the person who's argued this most consistently uh, is Stephen Croft uh, in his book Ministry in Three Dimensions. Uh, Stephen's now the Bishop of Oxford, but he was the warden of Cranmer Hall in Durham, and I think came to his views on Episcopae partly through teaching in a, a mixed Anglican Methodist context. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, he, he does. He, he, re, uh, he reconfigures also diaconal and presbyteral ministry. But but uh, but he makes the point that oversight, although bishops do do oversight, they're not the only people that do oversight. So you can find the notion of episcopate worked out in lots of places, not just in the embodied in a bishop. Uh, now that's an idea you find in lots of Anglican discussion documents. Uh, but I wonder how far that notion has permeated throughout Anglicanism. But that might be somewhere we've got some traction, because I think I, as an Anglican looking at Methodism, I would say that it's clear to me that the conference exercises Episcopate. That just seems to be you know, blindingly obvious. But it also it seems to me, this is slightly more, it seems to me that where Episcopate is exercised in Methodism uh, at a more local level is through through the work of superintendents, the clues in the title, and not through chairs of districts. But if you, anybody here is a superintendent or a chair of district, you might want to come back and go, I think. And that's what confuses Anglicans, because we look at, I've got to say that it was somebody like uh, Roger Walton who pointed this out to me, uh, we look at chair of district and we say, oh yeah, look, uh, they look as if they're the same space in the pecking order as a bishop, so we equate bishop with chair of district. But theologically, that's not the case. Uh, bishop in Anglicanism equates to superintendent in Methodism, I think. And if I wanted to find a parallel to a chair of district, I think I'd go for an archdeacon. Uh, but that's, but, so I think we've got some ministry structural questions that confuse us. Here's the next thing where Anglicans might do a bit of flexing. The Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral from 1886 and 88, first Lambeth Conference in 88. Uh, what are the boundary markers of Anglicanism? Uh, scripture, sacraments, creeds, and the key thing uh, for our purposes the historic episcopate locally adapted. From the beginnings of the Chicago Land Quadrilateral, it assumes that you can do episcopacy a variety of ways, and we haven't made a great deal of use of that. Um, 
I'm going to uh, cut to the very end now and say that... Uh, let me just whiz on to this. Let's have a look. I swear I can never do the, the maths of how many slides go on which bit of paper. Um, right. Um, let's try this. So the proposals currently before the General Synod and I think coming to conference uh, are about introducing the historic episcopate into Methodism by um, ordaining it by Anglican bishops consecrating the uh, president of conference as a bishop and then that person of course will remain a bishop so you get a kind of stacking up of past presidents who are bishops and therefore uh, Methodist presbyters will be ordained still by the president of conference who will then be a bishop. Uh, so that's, in, that's the mechanism for introducing historic episcopate. Um, I'd be interested to see whether, um, how that feels and looks to, to a Methodist audience. Um, uh, so we will have for many years lots of Methodist presbyters who have been ordained by conference without there being a bishop present. And I'm sorry to put this up, but this is the phrase that's used. The phrase that's used in the, in the document is that having uh, presbyters in the Methodist church uh, who then will be able to minister... Uh, as priests in the Church of England, but they've not been ordained by a bishop. That is known as that is called a bearable anomaly. Now, I, I don't, do not wish to think that any of you here that are Methodist presbyters are bearable anomalies, because some of you are actually my friends. Um, um, uh, but um, well, I'll just leave that there. Um, and the other thing I will say, just to finish with, two questions to finish with. My first question is stolen from my colleague Jane Leach at Wesley House in. Um, in Cambridge, if you know Jane Leach's pastoral theology reflection model, one of the things that Jane says is that any given pastoral situation, one of the things you've got to ask is, whose voices are we hearing and whose voices are we not hearing? And as I look at the Anglican Methodist proposals, I'm wondering whose voices I'm not hearing. And one of the voices I'm not hearing are, are Methodist voices, apart from the very few, which is partly why I thought I'd chance my arm with this this afternoon. And finally... I will go to my own bishop, with whom you'll see that I disagree. Uh, the Bishop of Norwich, in a couple of places, including in our Boston Centre recently, he's, he's quite a conservative Catholic in some ways, he would himself admit, that the Church of England has received the historic threefold orders, Bishop, Priest and Deacon, um, and um, the bearable anomaly for him is not bearable. And he would feel that the needs to, we need to go back to the older model of mutual laying on of hands. I don't think that's where we're at, but there are some Anglicans who do think that's where we're at. But, but I think a question that he raised at our Darston Synod, which I think is pertinent, is if we have this business of, um, um, of Anglicans coming along and ordaining the President of Conference as a bishop, we get episcopacy into the Methodist Church. But how do Anglicans receive from Methodists the many gifts that the Methodist Church has to give to Anglicans? How is that going to happen um, other than by osmosis? And as somebody who teaches liturgy mainly in my mind, I do think that ritual things are quite important. So I've been thinking about this, and I don't have an answer to it, as to how we might embody uh, the receiving of, the mutual receiving of gifts. So, uh, I do think there's a lot of things that we agree on, uh, but I do think that uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot, a lot to do. Uh, but my headline point is episcopacy within Anglicanism is much more variegated than people think and I wonder whether that gives us a theological kind of virtue of light. Right, thank you. Methodist friendly Anglican, so you can be very rude about the church because I don't mind. <laughs> to be honest, as an ex Anglican who reports out very local situation, um, my own perception of both churches is they have a clue as to how they make, on, on what basis they make decisions. Mm. So, in some, in some mm. senses, this is, I can't quite think of a uh, appropriate description, mm. but it's an extremely silly game because mm. nobody has any real knowledge of what they're playing. Yeah. Yeah. We're a bit theology light. Uh, in the way we do things, and actually, uh, what happens at the kind of macro level 
uh, is often out of step with what's happening at community at the local level. And that's the other factor that I don't think really brought into play. Sorry, Liz was going to ask. Well, I was going to say that speaking as a And uh, since we're both industrial educators, of course, our answer is we need to educate people. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's the like, how do you get these voices heard? And, 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 how do, and sometimes the voices that are heard are, as I, my neo-Calvinist example, from the thing, they are minority voices, but they shout quite loud. Uh, that's, that you, you, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in another theological place on the evangelical map of Church of England, so uh, you know, that's my slightly kind of <laughs> George's view of the neo-Calvinist. But... Um, uh, but I think it's like, how do you get the voices heard? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> bit tentative here because I'm not an Anglican nor Methodist, so perhaps I'm objective, but probably. <laughs> 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 I'm just wondering if you can tell us a bit about how the Church of England would change if it received the Methodist Church or if this union went forward. Mm. And if it doesn't change, mm. how is this energy? Yeah, I, th I think that's really important, and I think the numbers game is important because we can't get away from the fact that the Anglicans are numerically the, the, the bigger player, and, and that raises all kinds of uh, theological justice issues for me. Uh, and and I, as Liz might know, I, 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 I lived, lived through this when I was a member of staff at St John's College Durham, where at one stage one of our Methodist students said, uh, "What is the motto of the Wesley Study Centre? It is prepared to be absorbed by the Anglicans." because that was how it felt, and, 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 and I, along with lots of others on the staff, tried to work really hard to change the, to change the culture. Uh, and then we had some changes of staff and it changed back again. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, I think that's right, I think, yes, and I, I, I think um, it, it is the Bishop of Norwich's second question, how do Anglicans receive uh, gifts of ministry and theology from the Methodist Church? How, and, and do we actually know what gifts there are to receive? I think that's, that's also an issue. Uh, and uh, and I, I do think, you know, so again, slightly join this, but I'll be honest, I, I think that within the general synod, the, the tenor of these debates has been, uh, we like Methodists, we don't know very much about Methodism, but we kind of like Methodists, and it would be nice if we could have exchange of ministry and stuff like that, uh, but we don't really know what all that would mean beyond it. Um, so I can't give you an answer to your question, but it is actually absolutely the right question that we should be asking. Yes, well, well indeed. Is and, and, uh, yeah. um, yes, I mean, one of the things the Bishop of Norwich said the other week in our diocese was um, there are lots of Methodist presbyters that would really like to be um, ordained by an Anglican bishop. And I thought, I can't think of very many arguments. Perhaps I've got the wrong set of friends, but I can't think of very many. Uh, nor, would I, uh, nor would I be very keen you know, on, on going down that route. So I think, again, it is very pejorative. I uh, just couldn't. Um, uh, but um, I, think, I think one of the gifts that Methodism brings to the ecumenical table uh, is stuff around spirituality 
uh, and the perfect love stuff, I think, is actually quite important. Uh, you know, right wing stuff. Um, uh, so I think there are lots of gifts to be received. But uh, again, you know, the, the ecumenical juggernaut often assumes that everybody is kind of signed up to, to, to go this way, but that may not be the case. I think we probably made one more. Oh, sorry. Um, Judith. So I, I was just going to say from my very brief reading of, of the document, and I may have misread it. I mean, the language of boundary and anomaly, well, you didn't see this the first time I read it. Mm. I, I felt like going out and finding a t shirt that said, Hi, I'm a boundary. <laughs> However, I think if you read it really carefully, mm. it's the principle of having none of this could be a day yes. ministers. Yes. It's not the ministers themselves. No, that's right. It's and I think an awful lot of Methodist hackles are going to be up about an awful lot of things. Yeah. So at very least, we actually need to be clear. We're very good at getting angry yeah. with Anglicans. Let, yeah. Let's and I think I'm going to say that the, the, the use of language is important. I mean, my, my, uh, my, my doctoral research was on gender inclusive language. And um, uh, in, in the Church of England's worship, you know, before anybody says yes, it could be a very thin PhD. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but actually, one of the things I learnt from doing that is that the structure of the debate applies to other things other than gender. So going back to the Durham uh, example was uh, that at the same time I was starting serious work on the gender inclusive language stuff, we were, you know, a lot of my Anglican colleagues in Cranham Hall were saying in lectures where the third of the students were saying, when you're in a parish, you will find. You know, if this happens, you phone the archdeacon. And so one of the things I kept saying to the staff, my staff colleagues was, you have got to learn to speak ecumenically in lectures. And you've got to stop talking about parishes and start talking about local churches or do a certain inclusion like parish under the circuit. Uh, but it's all that stuff. It is, it is about language sets up expectation. Um, and uh, so I'm quite attuned to that, I think, language. And, and, uh, you're right, variable anomaly refers to the, to the theology, not to the person. But unfortunately, the phrase is there in the document uh, rather than ham fistedly, I think. Are you okay asking the question over tea? Because I think we probably ought to stop now. I'm going to do back at quarter two, quarter to four, and we've had tea, coffee, and quick break. Thank you.